be. Cool. Okay, let me go over the agenda briefly. So um, this is our DevSecOps Hangout. So it's designed to be educational, cover um, very deep technology. So we hope everyone here um, enjoys it. Um, I'm doing a quick welcome and kickoff. Um, up, up first is going to be Bill Manning, Solutions Engineering Manager, who we're just talking about to talk about the truth about machine learning. Then we have a session with Zohar Sox and Sean Pratt. Zohar is our Senior Director of Product, and Sean is our Senior Product Marketing Manager, and they're going to talk about bridging the gap between AI, ML model management, and DevSecOps. And then finally, Melissa McKay, who we're just talking to, um, is going to be joining us for a panel on how to secure your ML development lifecycle. And everybody who's joining here has entered um, to be a winner to score a $50 gift card. We're going to um, announce this via email after the hangout but you know just relax enjoy and don't worry about that and you'll be contacted if you're one of the lucky winners okay so with that um thanks a lot melissa for joining us we'll see you I'll in a bit in your panel and um bill um why yeah. don't you tell us a little bit about the truth about machine learning Absolutely. So let me share my screen here. Um, so, you know, as stated, um, I decided to, if I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, basically machine learning, ML, um, it's going to be a good segue. It's kind of a, I'm, I'm kind of queuing it up uh, for my, uh, you know, my coworkers here uh, that'll be discussing how uh, JFrog is attacking uh, some of the situations and information uh, behind this. But let's get started, right? So um, as stated, I'm actually uh, the senior solution uh, architect uh, for JFrog uh, for the Americas. Um, I'm also uh, managing a small team here uh, that's working on it. Uh, if you'd like to follow me, of course, you can do that. But let's get right into the whole thing. Right. So first of all, um, I always love this quote, especially when we start talking about things like AI. Right. You know, I had to throw the Arthur C. Clarke stuff up here. You know that any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, I love this quote, right? And this is pretty much the thing with any new technology or anything that's on the market. You know, people have been talking about AI for years uh, and all these things, and now AI is everywhere, right? Uh, and AI, you know, is, is fueled uh, by machine learning and models and data and all these things. And the thing is, is like, we've almost jumped the shark. You know, like the pictures I have here, you know, AI art, uh, you know, Samsung is now AI powered phone, you know, cars, TVs, you know, of course, everyone knows chat GPT. And my buddy was at CES and he sent me this picture of the, the first AI chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's getting getting a little ridiculous. You know, it's now become a marketing term for everything that's out there. I'm just waiting for like AI organic food goods. Um, you know, I think that'll be the next step. Um, but anyway, machine learning is really the basis behind everything, right? The idea behind it is is, is this idea of, of of machine learning. And the thing is, is that, you know, machine learning started in, you know, 1959, you know, it was coined uh, by Arthur Samuel, you know, the idea of a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, right? And they're still, uh, they're still programming, you know, so it's not completely accurate in that respect, you know, there's still ag algorithms and those algorithms get fed data. So I decided to ask ChatGPT um, <laughs> what it thought about it, right? And of course, it gave the very generic answer of that machine language is essentially a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, that basically just, you know, uses learning methods uh, to create what it does, right? To And then over time and iteratively, it goes ahead and, and improves its performance, the outcome of what it does, and all these kind of things, right? So the basic idea was this, but I'm going to go one step further. The real definition from MIT is machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence that broadens the capabilities of machines to imitate intelligent human behavior. Now, the thing is, is that when we think about AI, of course, we think about like things like chat GPT, help me compose an email or, you know, now with coding and programming, you know, help me build a, a programming model that allows me to do X, Y, Z, right? There's AI art. There's all these things, but it all comes down to machine learning, right? It's a small subset of being able to to actually have it so perform tasks over time by having as much data as possible that makes it do what it does right algorithmically it allows you uh, to build these you know take these models and turn them into something uh functional and the thing is is that when we start talking about it 
It's now in 2023, um, now we're in 2024, right? Though the idea from a research report that was done by Rackspace is 72% of the companies surveyed, you know, that AI and machine learning is going to be a huge part of their business strategy going forward. And that 69% is AI ML is the most important technology that they could implement today. Right. And the thing is, is that there's dangers here. I'm wanting to talk about fun dangers. I like danger. And the thing is, is that these companies are adopting it to improve existing things like business performance and and reduce risk and, you know, improve processes. And, and it's true. Right. I mean, the thing is, the sheer magnitude of data that's out there that can be accumulated is definitely vast and great that can actually improve the way companies do the things that they do. And the thing is, is that we need to talk about a lot of different pieces behind this. And that's training data. Right. We could talk about algorithms, we could talk about the different models, and we could talk about all these different things. But one subset of this, and one important piece of this, is training data. Because not is it only the most essential bit to building any sort of you know AI intelligence or any sort of machine learning model, but it's also the most dangerous factor here. And the thing is, is that training data is what you use to train your algorithms to do and create models on what they do, right? This is the major piece. And the other thing about it is, is that it's not just throw the model at it and do something. There's a human intervention component behind this that we'll talk about, which is when that data comes in, you have to take it, you figure out like what parameters, because like in some models, you might have 7 billion parameters or 70 million parameters, or it depends, right? The parameters are the amount of data between each subset and each line that's part of this. And determining which parameters you would like to utilize to train your models take some humans to get involved in this. So when we talk about machine learning, there's still a human element that's behind it. And the thing is, is that, you know, it depends on how you do this, how you program it, um, how you utilize it, how you treat, you know, tweak your algorithm maybe to use this. And, you know, the thing is, is that even though it is a machine learning model, like I said, humans training the, taking the data to train those models is really one of the most essential bits. But the thing is, is you got to think about the data itself, right? These are the thing is, is that there's a couple different types of training data. I'm not going to go into models. There's like llama. There's like you know the meta stuff. There's there's tons of different models that are out there. But there's two main categories. You have proprietary. Those are the ones you pay for, right? Or or most of the time they're con just controlled. Some are paid. Most are just controlled. They're usually gigantic, larger case studies. Um, you know, they're, a lot of them have like non-parameters, so you can go in and tweak it, uh, maybe to uh, be flagged for different types of stuff. They're kind of expensive. Um, they are license restricted, right? That's another thing too. In some cases, some companies don't want the license restriction. Sometimes they're better, sometimes they're not. You know, you are limited to a set of data that's produced by somebody. And of course, those somebodies have their own agenda when they're doing this. So the thing is, is that you need to also kind of take a step back when you're going through these and look at the source of these models. Now, the biggest subset, things like Hugging Face and lots of the other open source repositories that are out there, they're free. Right, they come from larger community bases. They have a huge amount of influx of data that comes in from multiple sources. A lot of the times, it's research data. These come from universities and and things like that, or medical companies, depending on the market you're into. I mean, I'm not even going into verticals. Right, I'm talking about high level types of modeling here. And the thing is, is they're usually modelable. They're usually transparent. And sometimes the license restrictions, most of the time, uh, the license restrictions are are a little looser. And the thing is, is that there's tons of them out there. Now, later on, uh, Zohar and Sean are going to be talking about the work that we do in terms of ML ops. And I'll touch upon that towards the end and how we do things with like, you know, sources like Hugging Face, right? These large, lang large language models that are out there, um, you know, gigabytes at a time that you can pull down uh, to use it. And when they talk about it, they'll talk about the fact is, is that these are big models. I mean, that's the thing is, Training models themselves are gigabytes in size or larger, depending on the size and the set of the information that you're pulling in to build what you're trying to build or train what you're trying to do with this data. 
And there's four different types of machine learning, right? There's the supervised one where like data scientists, you know, label things and they do what they want to do. They're constantly correlating and assessing the models and working with them. There's some that are like unsupervised, which means is that you, you basically munge the data to the way you need it. You plug it into the, into the, into it and get back your results and, and assess them that way, but they're not constant. They're semi-supervised, meaning that you're always kind of going in and doing small tweaks and, and things to it. I mean, you're always tweaking, but there's different types. And then there's reinforcement, right? And then the reinforcement one is the one that's working more like a programming algorithm um, that might be used to accomplish uh, some sort of set of goals that you might have as a company. But when it comes to all these different types of machine learnings that are out there, and the thing is, by the way, each one of these has their different types of applications, depending on the vertical you're in. You know, companies choose the type of machine learning that best suits what they're trying to do. And that's the reason why, you know, usually some sort of data as a scientist or engineer will have some sort of interjection into this. But the biggest thing here is training data still, right? We're focusing on that because the thing is that when we, like I said, when we talk about how JFrog is doing certain things, we're gonna talk about, you know, some of the security sides of this training data. I'm not gonna spoil the fun. But the thing is with training data, the biggest thing you have to do is, right, you have to have an understanding of your of the domain you're trying to work within, right? You know, prior knowledge of some sort and setting some sort of goals. You know, what is your end result going to be hopefully be, right? It's more of a core, it's more of a hypothesis and correlation, but you want to have a definitive set of goals to prove such a hypothesis correlation, or in some cases, just a service, right? Being able to provide a service with the correct set of, of, of output uh, at the end. You know, all also, too, making sure that the data integration and integrity, make sure that you're cleaning the data, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, build the learning model around it, you know, being able to go and interpret the results that come back and, and then correlate and deploy and then do it all again. The thing is, is that when you go ahead and you use training data, like I said before, it's not just pulling down this big blob of data and then just pointing your algorithm at it and hoping for the best. The thing is, is that, you know, you go in, you look at the data, you figure out how you want to parameterize. You actually spend more time uh, working on actually munging the data to fit into the model that you need based on the parameters you need to train your, your, your actual machine learning, then in most cases actually executing it, right? And the thing is, it's an iterative process. It's never stopping. It's always going. You're always learning and refining and, and, and determining whether your algorithm might be skewed or maybe there's a way to improve your algorithm, you know, speed, efficiency, accuracy, um, or looking at the data itself and saying, you know what, there might be some problems with this data and we'll talk about those problems in a few minutes. And the thing is, is that actually right now, sorry, like, and on the right hand side was this amazing um, tweet, you know, uh, X or tweet, and I don't know what we call it now, right? Um, that I said, you know, the whole idea is AI is possibly taking over the world and end all, all our future, right? I love this one. I think the AI at camera mistaking a bald referee's head for a ball. I mean, that's just amazing. You know, this is where data training comes into play. But the thing is, is that you need to be cautious of the data modeling that you're using in machine learning because there's a lot of things. There's things like hallucinations, um, like you know the idea that the, the data is skewed in a way that it's producing results that aren't really there. Um, bias. This is huge. Um, you know, the thing is, is this sometimes in this data, uh, these data sets, you download them, depending on who prepared them, they might be biased towards one way or another, right? Skewing your results. Uh, they might contain things like malware. Um, you know, the thing is surprisingly, and we'll talk about that because it's one of the things that we're trying to address as a company or things like data poisoning. Um, I know recently uh, there's a couple of tools out there, right? That uh, for say AI images, um, you know, I produced a bunch of AI images for this because I thought it would be fun. But now content creators are learning that the content that is being utilized to train, say, AI models through machine learning and data sets. And people are actually, there's actually products out there that now can take images and inject a poison pill, not allowing it to be deciphered and encoded and, and turned into a model that can be used in AI art generation. 
Um, consent and copyright. This is a big one. Um, there's been a lot of cases where a lot of these models are using, um, you know, data that's out there from people who have copyrighted their material. Uh, things like ChatGPT, they went through a lot of this and sanitizing their data to include, make sure they didn't have any sort of copyrighted material in there uh, without permission, right? Getting that consent. This is a big thing too. Um, malicious URLs. There's times in there where the data sets are pointing to externalized things that might correlate to this data and cause problems too. Another one is jailbreaking. I, you know, it's funny. I always when I think jailbreak. I think phones. I uh, jailbroke my phone so I could sideload applications on my iPhone. I did that. I'll admit it. Way back when. Um, but jailbreaking in this case is how to, is breaking the model itself, right? Interjecting data into the model that's inconsistent with the other data strands that are inside uh, the model of that you're using for your training. Also, two things, indirect you know, prompt injections. This is a big one, too. In some cases, those models have the ability to inject specific components or traits or characteristics or parameters that can inclusively break the things that you're trying to accomplish with those models. Malicious instructions, that's another big one. I mean, these all kind of you know speak for itself. Then the biggest things are private information, right? Private, you know, especially in the healthcare industry where they're building these giant model sets and algorithms that they're trying to use to solve some of the uh, the basic necessities of humanity, you know, like you know, curing, solving, and doing those things. Um, in some cases, there's a lot of private information that's in there, and that private information can be exploited, and it has been in the past. Um, there's a lot of concerted efforts for companies who are producing these, these training sets, this training data, uh, to ensure that, you know, that personal health care information, personal information um, is not included, right? Because there have been people that have been known to extract this, or counterfeit sources, bogus information. Think about this. Say you're building a giant model and you have billions of records you're using to train the model and you find out that just 2%, that's all it takes, 1% to 2% of the sources inside of that model to be counterfeit. That can be strong enough inside of, say, depending on the parameters that you've chosen, can be strong enough to skew your results tremendously, maybe causing advanced you know, hurt to the way you're doing your machine learning, right? It could completely destruct your model. This is danger. These are things that happen all the time. People need to understand that when you're looking at train at training data for your, you know, for ML, you know, for machine learning, there's a lot of pieces, a lot of information that's there that could really cause detrimental harm. Um, not just because it's going to cause your pro problem in your company, it can cause problems to people, right? I mean, there's a human factor behind all of this. I mean. I don't know about you, but like I said, when you know, like when I see things like Google, it's like I'm going to do an assessment of the articles for you, and and you know, I'm going to break it down and use like a large language model. Here's a summary of all the things that have happened. Well, what happens if I'm looking at something and the data that they're using that they correlated to create this summary had skewed results and bias, right? That can be very dangerous. I mean, information is king, and misinformation is terrible. So how do you secure, right? How do you ensure? So there are automated security integrity tools that are out there, right? Going through and, and there's more and more coming onto the market where you can look at the data set, have it evaluate the data set. And we'll talk about that with some of the stuff we're doing with Hugging Face to do this. Another thing is cultures and audits. Don't take that data strand, you know, that information that you have as being gold, right? You gotta be, you actually have to have a culture of skepticism when you're looking at the data, just to make sure, and constant audits, you know, making sure you have the proper accountability uh, uh, behind the scenes, right? Make sure that when you're looking at this, that you have the people in place, uh, the testing tools in place to have accountability behind the data. It's your responsibility as an organization. Educate your people. That's another one too. Make sure that everybody's educated on both the you know both the ethical ramifications and also to the you know the ramifications in terms of uh, of what's going to be put into the into the model itself when you're doing the machine learning, right? Understand those key components. Do random test samples pre and post. Take that data that you have and pull subsets out and do evaluations on it to make sure 
that you're looking at it and that you're not getting those biases. You're not getting personal information. You're not getting bogus URLs or, you know, bogus content, right? That's huge. You know, making, you know, you should be doing samples at a time to make sure the integrity is there. Also implementing some sort of governance, right? Governance is key. Um, you know, the thing is, is that you shouldn't just have a bunch of engineers running around, pulling data sets, building algorithms and doing that. You know, one of the things we should start doing, and this is just a personal feeling, and, and this is something that's definitely going to be coming, is governance is coming. Right. It's already started with the uh, U.S. government. Uh, the Biden administration is putting the, you know, the idea of guardrails while still investing in AI and, and encouraging it. But when putting in some sort of guardrails uh, to ensure that, you know, the quality, the bias, you know, all these kind of data integrity mannerisms are there behind what you're trying to do in terms of doing like ML ops or, you know, machine learning or AI or any of those, right? And then also have a clearly defined process that when you are talking with your teams, when you are working with this data, uh, that, you know, you have the steps in play. You need to take those extra steps when you're doing this, munging the data, making sure the training data, running subsets, you know, making sure that when you are building your models, because remember, you could have algorithms algorithms all day long. You can have awesome UI interfaces that produce, uh, you know, AI art. It, you know, helps summarize the human DNA strand. It, you know, anything that's out there that can be done these days. But the thing is, remember, it's being powered by data. And this data is the most essential bit. The better the, better the training, the better it will be. And the thing is, is that, you know, I talk a lot with customers all the time. And yeah, they're like, yeah, we got this initiative to do, you know, AI and, and, and ML and, and, and they're like, we're ready to jump in. And you need to have process. You need to have that ethical talk with your engineers because it could be something terrible, right? We've learned this in the past. We've seen examples of this out there. Um, and, you know, we have to be careful. And the thing is, remember, the AI train is a rocking and along now, right? You know, we're getting closer to things like AGI, um, you know, artificial general intelligence, right? What if the data that was used to train this was, you know, destroy all humans? You know, I mean, I, I for one welcome our new AI overlords, but at the same time, um, right, you, you know, you need to be aware of this stuff. So this jumps into the idea of what we're going to be discussing, which is things like ML ops, right? So this is why we're here. You know, this is one of the main things that we're doing, you know, at, at JFrog. And that the idea here is, is that when we start looking at, at this idea, it's like if I went to the right-hand side, those two loops to the right-hand side here, you know, dev and ops, that's your standard dev ops, right? Release, planning, deployment, and all that. ML ops gives you that ability to pull in machine learning to improve the things that you're doing, to move forward, right? To pull, pull in an extra horsepower, you know, you, you know, harnessing the data, harnessing the algorithms to make the things that you do better, to make the things that you do more efficient over time. And the thing is, is that by using that data to build and understanding the security aspects of the things I discussed above, because remember, this could affect your organization tremendously. Security, ethicity, and those kind of things are things that you need to be constantly aware of while you're doing this. But MLOps usage here is simple. Improve stability and security, right? If done correctly. Make things reproducible and reliable by using these models, right? Learn from others, pull in these models, you know, also collect all that information in your organization over time and feed it into the algorithm to find out your deficiencies, find out where things have gone wrong. When you're working with data scientists, you know, the thing is, is that when they go through these iterative processes of building these models, or even if you're using things like, you know, uh, you know, operations wise, like, you know, in IT, you know, making sure that you have the data to do things like scaling usage, like say for a Kubernetes cluster or increasing security by having active awareness of like uh, maybe a potential DDoS attack or, an application shell or numerous other things that could affect you out there, being able to use these models to detect early what could potentially threats to you. Also too, improving collaboration. This is huge between data scientists and IT. Um, a lot of the times, right, there's that seg a segmentation between the two 
And in a way, it's almost like what happened with DevOps, right? Where we got developers and operations together, you know, way back in 2008 with the whole thing is, you know, you build it, you run it. We're going into that side of this market now, too. Uh, now the idea of, you know, the operations team turning to, I mean, the data scientists turning to, you know, the operations team and saying, hey, we're trying to improve this and do these things. Now it's more of a collaborative effort. You throw that in with DevSecOps and you have a super powerhouse automate as much as possible possible, improve security, right? Being able to have better communication between teams. Communications between teams doesn't hurt, right? Also being able to maintain and monitor, monitor this stuff, right? Because have the data scientists do what they do, have the operations team look at how it's operating and what it's doing, you, you really get a second set of eyes. You add that extra layer of, you know, of, of, of uh, abilities behind that. And then, then behind this also too, you can actually produce new products, right? You can actually maybe even build things, discover new things as an organization. You could have enhanced data, you know, it's, it's, it's so amazing to me where things are going and how quickly and rapidly it's changing but we need to be aware right we need to be aware as, as an organization you know as people as humans um working with machines um and and, and ensuring that we have you know we're we're there together it's not just here's the data give me an output it's here's the data let me refine the data make sure it's safe make sure i'm getting non-skewed results all these kind of things, right? These are kind of the things that we really need to be aware of. Everybody talks about what's you know, possible, and I love that, but we also have to be aware of the potential and the potential of threats, the potential of, you know, like I said, ethical issues, the potential of misinformation, you know, copyright infringement. It's There's tons of things to be aware of, right? We can't just go, you know, diving into this head first like we have so far. Now we have to go in and add some, you know, guardrails around it to make things better, that governance, right? Get people involved, discuss, talk, not just do. And the thing is, is that one of the things that I'm kind of, you know, queuing it up for my fellow co-workers for the next talk here is the idea that, you know, how do you bring this and bridge the gap between automation and they'll be talking about this, you know, everything from data ops to modeling ops to runtime ops, right? Being able to go in and use this data, this information, work with scientists and make it more efficient. But well, one of the things they're going to discuss today is the security aspect behind it. And, you know, this is going to be huge. I mean, I'm I'm very excited for the future um, in this case. But I'm also terrified that if the, you know, things aren't put in place, if people aren't aware of the potential threats behind everything, uh, just like it was, you know, with the whole, like, you build it, you run it, you know, we went through that period of time of people deploying applications, uh, you know, right, you know, basically put into production as fast as you can. Uh, you know, we had problems for a while, right? Data leaks and all that. This could be potentially almost worse, right? Um, so, Please be aware that when we start looking at these kind of components, we start looking at you know machine learning, always keep the training data in mind, always keep the security behind it, the potential threats that you have, like, like hallucinations, you know, the data is not really there. Uh, it just seems like it is uh, an apparition that could actually be terrible. Um, and the thing is, is that it's really up to your organization to do this. So I just wanted to say thank you for your time. I hope this has been informative. Um, if you have any, well, we can always discuss uh, any questions you have there uh, in the uh, panel segment. But this is my job, and I hope it's been informative to you guys. Cool. Thanks a lot, Bill. That was really informative, a lot of fun. And um, I, I think that um, you painted the future with all of the AI-generated images. So. <laughs> um, not only is, is AI the future, but it's also creating the image of the future for us. Yes, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And um, I want to introduce our next two presenters. So we're going to be talking about bridging the gap between AI ML model development and DevSecOps. We have Zohar Sachs joining us. He's um, in charge of product at JFrog and really the one making all the decisions and doing all the fun stuff. And we have Sean Pratt, who is our senior PMM um, and also knows all about things which we're doing at JFrog to address the sort of issues which um, Bill talked about for model development. So take it away, Sohar and Sean. Do you see my screen? Yeah, yep, right. Looks good. 
Okay. Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean, as uh, Steve mentioned, here with Zohar. Uh, we're really happy to be presenting this to you. Um, I heard that this thing was happening, and I asked if I could participate, and Zohar was like, sure, you can present some slides in my presentation. So thanks, Zohar, for uh, letting, me, letting me join you here. Uh, we're going to talk. I mean, Bill did such a good job. He covered a lot of uh, ground really quickly in that presentation. But as Steve mentioned, we're going to talk about and probably what a lot of folks are here interested to hear is like, how do we start to take the DevOps, DevSecOps mindset and apply that to um, creating ML models and bringing them into um, your secure software supply chain and the SDLC, the processes uh, that you're used to using for traditional applications um, that you spent many years and months and hours thinking about um, to deliver trusted software to your organization. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Unless, Zohar, you want to add anything else before we get started? No, let's go. Let's get in the motion. All right, awesome. So we always like to make sure everyone's on the same level. So some of this might be uh, like you're nodding your head like, okay, we get it, but let's just put it out there so that we're all on the same page. So, you know, what is a software supply chain? And I think most people are familiar that, a software supply chain is, is really what's enabled software or helped enable software to be produced so quickly, um, right? It's the chain of components, libraries, tools, processes, people um, that are ultimately used to develop, build, and publish a software artifact, right? We have all of those open source components that we're able to bring in. We've got our first party components that we've built. We've got the tools and the automation that you've set up. All of those things that help us move software or code from the left to the right. And what does that look like typically, right? It's uh, if we break it down into a very simple, simple look at it, there's coding, you have a software developer engineer who is, you know, in their IDE, writing some, some code, referencing some dependencies, uh, they're creating new applications or microservices. Those get pushed into the build phase where maybe you had some, DevOps person who's helped set up some tooling and automation um, to create whatever your application might be. It might be a microservice, it might be a mobile app, it might be you know, any number of things that, that's consumed. And then ultimately it's deployed, right? It could be back in the day, put onto a CD that's sent out to, you know, you used to get those uh, AOL CDs in the mail all the time. Uh, you know, it might be published to, um, an app store, it might be a service that's accessed from the internet, but whichever way you're getting that piece of software that you've written into the hands of someone who consumes it. Now, while the software supply chain has helped speed things up, it also adds two new important components that organizations have to manage, which is the security and compliance, right? There's security around controlling what comes into your organization, making sure that those third-party dependencies that you've brought in don't have known vulnerabilities, that they aren't malicious packages, which is, you know, on the rise. All these hackers and mean people have discovered that uh, your software supply chain is a golden ticket to get in and uh, try to expose you and uh, attack you. Um, and the other element is the compliance, right? You know, uh, are the licenses that you're using for those um, open source components, are, are those ones that are good to use, or are they going to end up biting in the butt where you're having to pay, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars because you didn't check uh, to make sure that the component was approved for use in your paid application, right? So in order to kind of get to a nice streamlined software supply chain process, there's a bunch of uh, other ops and terms that have come into play, which we'll, we'll quickly cover here. Um, so you know, ML ops and DevSecOps, there's all these ops, there's all these terms, people are kind of using them sometimes, uh, depending on who you talk to, they might mean slightly different things. So we'll just kind of put them out here to make sure we're on the same page. So ML ops, obviously machine learning operations, Bill touched on it and he did a really good job. So we can kind of gloss over this, but you know, what are the, the practices and processes to automate and simplify the workflows that give you a new model that can be Part of your application and deployed, right? The goal is to make it so that the process is um, repeatable, you get expected outcomes, and also just there's transparency and other stakeholders in your organization understand 
what's going on with the the models that you're producing. DevSecOps, well, we're all here for DevSecOps, so we kind of know that one, right? We're integrating security into the DevOps process. It's no longer security sits out and you kind of do it as an afterthought. It's really integrated and woven into the full uh, life cycle of development. Uh, development, planning, coding, building, testing your application, we're all familiar with that. Now, security, right? Ensuring that you release an application that is free from exploitable vulnerabilities and malicious code. And as Bill mentioned, now it's also looking at data sets as well, right? There's so much more to security today than there ever was before in things that you need to watch out for, defend against, and be proactive about. And operations, you know, making sure that what you build is released in the most efficient way that you can monitor it, track that it's performing the way that you expect, and fix any issues, right? Um, everything you put out is a reflection of your organization. Um, there's, at any given time, any number of competitors that are also trying to steal your eyeballs, steal your, your customers away from you. So making sure that things operate and perform as expected is, is highly important. So if we take it one step forward and look at, you know, how does this translate from the traditional SDLC, the traditional kind of coding process that we're all used to, and kind of convey some of these ideas and practices to ML models, um, it's actually not as different as you think. There are, of course, some big differences, but there are some similarities, right? We, we talked about that kind of three steps, you code, you build, you deploy in kind of traditional applications. Well, in developing ML models, there's, you know, we can also break it down into these kind of three um, stages, if you will. The first is creating the data, which Bill talked a lot about, right? You, have a, you might have a data scientist who is um, defining, labeling, munging all that data so that it's clean and it works for um, the model that you're trying to produce. You then go about and kind of build the model with the data, the algorithms, pieces of code that help it all come together. Um, there's a whole training process that goes in, into that, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And then ultimately, you deploy that model to be used right, as part of a modern application, um, or you might put it out there for the world to take the model and, and play with it in their, their own right. So again, as you look at the, the stages of data model and deploy, just like with traditional um, applications, you have to now think compliance and security across the whole way. And Bill did a really good job kind of highlighting how it starts even with the data where um, if your data isn't uh, clean, isn't appropriate, you know, there's ways that using bad data or malicious data will totally skew the results of the model that you're creating. And similarly, if you're looking at models, you know, just like there are open source packages, there are open source models that are enabling organizations to play with and experiment with infusing AI into their, their products and their applications. But those models, um, are also now another venue that malicious code can be injected, right? You might have a model that somewhere hidden inside that complex binary is some remote executable, for example, right? You don't want that to be brought into your ecosystem and eventually make it make its way into an application that you're releasing. So maintaining those threads of compliance and security, just like you do for um, traditional application development are just as important for developing ML models. So the big area where we see the differences, right, between coding and ML models comes down to that, that training phase. And we'll take a look at the same diagram that um, Bill had up, right? You collect data, you prepare. What's unique here is that unlike um, traditional development, development, where if you use the same inputs, you kind of get the same result, the training phase is way more complex. And I'm gonna hand it over here to Zohar, who's gonna talk a little bit about that and where um, we go from here. Thank you, Sean, uh, very interesting. And uh, yeah, Bill, Bill mentioned earlier that data is like the, the queen of this process, uh, but data doesn't um, start and end usually um, before you train. Data is something that follow your process throughout the process, uh, because you, you have some set of data, probably a subset of your data that is being used to train, at the beginning, and then you are preparing the data. Sometimes uh, 
uh, clean it, cleanse it, remove malicious stuff, everything like this. And then you start, uh, and then you start training. After training, you evaluate your model. And this is like a process, of course, can happen several times until the evaluation is good enough for the business needs. And then you're getting to deploying, deploying the model. And once the model is deployed, basically what's happening is that the, the, the model, sometimes for the, same, the first time, is actually meeting um, a real market data, okay? And then you need to, to do a run again, a process of uh, um, retraining the model. And this is, can happen on some organization, I don't know, quarterly. And we uh, already seen organization that this has happened every 15 minutes. Okay, if you're running an e-commerce shop or an advertisement shop, you want the model to predict based on the current data, on the current tips, on the current trends. This entire process is creating a lot of assets and is creating quite a nightmare when it comes to versioning and uh, and managing uh, what need to go to which uh, deployment. Because as we can probably understand, just like in packages, that you can have the same package with the same name that is being used with different versions in different services or microservices, the same thing can happen here. You can have the same model, sort of, in a in different version uh, because of the cadence of the service it, it's it's being used by or being hosted in. And uh, you need to manage all this, uh, all this complex uh, shop of uh, what's connected to what, which software version was used with which training time, and et cetera. And this is something that we see in a minute how we can assist you with. So the main problem here is that the market is, is exploding. There are tons of tools. Each one of them at the same time is covering uh, some part of the market. And there is a ton of overlap as well between some of them. Uh, so uh, it's really hard to understand what is the right path to go from data to device. Okay, it's really hard to, to build your own process. And to, in today's world, when you want teams to have the freedom to select these tools, it's not very rare to see a company when there are three, four, five different procedures to do ML uh, or ML ops in a company. So this makes the world really, really hard. Uh, sometimes you undergo an m a or you do some experiment with some technology. And just like in software, it all of a sudden becomes the software you need to be aware of it when you are building a processes. Um, and this creates like sort of a Wild West environment. Okay, so we have models from all those tools and you need to understand where you want to store them. And with models, just like with software, you have several levels of storage that you need. Some models are pure ephemeral. You just run an experiment or you are uh, doing some test or playing around and uh, you, you, you just want them to be ephemeral and being thrown away if they're not good enough. Some models should be saved for longer and some models due to regulation need to be sell, uh, saved for as long as your regulation forces you to save your software. It can be two years, five years, seven years and the most we heard from customers is 20 years. Depends on the industry. And of course, the regulator can come in at any time and ask you about the model. And when they're talking about the model, they're talking about the model, the packages, the data, the algorithms, the parameters, the hyperparameters, the settings, anything you can think of, the Docker that was used to run it, anything you can think of because it needs to be reproducible. Uh, then you need to decide which version to use. As we spoke earlier, uh, you might have several versions of the model. It might depend on several versions of software. It might depend on several versions of data. And you need to, to understand how to draw the line. What am I about to do? Am I, am I allowed to do it? And uh, this is, for us, part of the model lifecycle. Coming to compliance, you need to track the model or region. Sometimes the license doesn't allow you to use models in certain regions, just like in software. Sometimes the models come from companies that are no longer there or from some fishy um, um, fishy origins. Um, we, we always say that uh, in the software world, uh, if somebody wants to attack your company, it's really hard to attack your company. It takes a lot of money. But if I found out that you're using some open source that is maintained by a small group of, feature, of people, uh, I can come and make them a monetary offer and probably buy them in much less money to cost you to affect, to affect your organization. And then immediately I have a foot foot uh, in the door in your organization. Same will happen with models for sure. If you are relying on a model that is uh, 
um, owned by some small body or some volunteers, it will be really easy to overtake it even either by money or by contributing uh, and, and gain some access to your organization. Uh, we have policies in our company, okay? Maybe we are not allowed to use some sort of data, licensing, um, sizes, performance, etc. We need to manage all these things, origins, we need to manage all these things. Maybe we, are, we don't want to use models that were trained in some country. So we, we, need, we need to find a way to manage all those policies. And then in the security field, we want to check that our models do not uh, include malicious or unsecure code because basically a model is a piece of code that is running inside your memory space, inside one of your services, inside your perimeter of security. And uh, and um, the most important thing is, you know, data scientists are a little bit different than developers. There was a some revolution a few years ago called the DevOps revolution. I guess all of us are living it as, as it is now, which somehow made developers understand that one of the things they need to do in their profession is to become better developers and better mean to have more reliable, secure, robust code. DevOps, uh, sorry, data science is not there yet. Data scientists are more mathematicians, researchers. They want to uh, to uh, focus on those areas. Uh, we see sprouts of, of uh, understanding that they need to write uh, proper software. I hope I'm not offending anybody by doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but uh, there is there is a, a path to go there. And on top of it, when you want to, to add somebody to your SDLC, you need to, to uh, bridge the gap for them because the SDLC is already concrete, already in some tooling, and maybe the data scientist is working in a totally different tool set. So let's talk about our trusted model management. We started by having integration with Hugging Face. And with the integration with Hugging Face, we are, we are giving you two uh, main capabilities. The first one is what we call the remote repo. The remote repo uh, is allowing you to cache the models that you are planning to use. One of the main problems we see with open source software, models and packages as well, uh, that it might disappear. Sometimes the contributor finished their PhD and they don't want to maintain it anymore. Or they got laid off from a company and they got hold of the model and they can delete it or anything else that happened. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have some business need and you, you need some time to overcome this thing or you want you, it's good enough to use an old version of the model. So you need a, a, a version of the model stored in your perimeter. Uh, so for this, we have the Hugging Face Remote. Hugging Face, by the way, if anybody ever, somebody haven't heard about it yet, is a very common hub of models working on commoditizing open source models usage. But as we've seen earlier in the slides, uh, in our slides and build slides, the training process is uh, happening again and again. And basically, after you take an open source model, you will retrain it or fine tune it using your own data. And then immediately, this model will become proprietary data. If you want to preserve it somewhere and you want to maintain the same API, the same SDK you used before. And for this, we have something called the, the Hugging Face Local Repo inside the factory, which allow you to store the same artifact, the same model, the same. Uh, uh, data that you have inside Artifactory and make sure it get to uh, to uh, deployment just the same. Uh, both of them are being scanned by X-Ray, so no malicious thing can happen. The nice thing about X-Ray, uh, okay, when it comes to license scanning, after you cache it, license won't change. But when it comes to malicious and model scanning, malicious model scanning, uh, as you know, CVs are being discovered periodically. Um, and it might happen that using a piece of software today that in two months will be discovered to be malicious. If this happened, X-Ray automatically will block this software from being used in your organization. And that's a very, very good benefit for using X-Ray. Uh, on top of all those uh, feature lists, we are basically standardizing the MLOps process. Your entire code will, will have no change if you go from local, from remote to local. Uh, you, are, you can automate checking that the code is okay, the licensing is okay, and you have once one one uh, single source of truth for all your model needs. Sorry. 
On top of it, we have all the components in one place. The model is not living by itself. The model is living with the Docker that, that containing it is part of a probably a Python code that hosting it. The training was written in Python probably. So you want to maintain all of it together for many reasons, for reproducibility, for stability, and of course, for regulation. Uh, so that's something that we really, really uh, important to emphasize. And we provide a simplified versioning mechanism. And one of the problems with models is that uh, there is no clear, clear versioning mechanism uh, to use models. Uh, companies tend to try to adopt something, to build something. But with us, whenever you upload a model or wherever you are getting a new version from Hugging Face, a new version uh, will be created. So we will have a system of record with all the history of the models that you want, um, that you used, sorry, uh, which is quite important, again, to maintain uh, to maintain the stability and robustness of your process. Uh, looking a little bit uh, into, the, into the connection to the SDLC, so a regular, um, a regular, uh, ML process will contain some Python code uh, that will host a model that will sit inside the Docker for deployment. With us, you can hold both of them. If you're using OCI instead of Docker, you can, of course, use OCI. We have many, many languages, almost 40. So if instead of Python, you use Conda or R or Java, Go, any language you use to host your model, you can uh, um, you can find an artifactory and uh, host your code aside with your model. And as we said earlier, we have this versioning thing. And in the future, we'll have a, link, um, a linkage between all those parts together so you can know exactly um, what was the um, packages, dockers, models, etc., that you've been using throughout the process. Uh, the integration is very, very easy. All you need to do, this is like a part of our set me up uh, in uh, JFrog for every package, we have a set me up page that explain easily how to set up and configure the package client to use, uh, to use, uh, to connect to a uh, JFrog. So basically you need those two lines of code to connect, to export those two lines. And then you get immediately a seamless integration with all the hanging face model sets, transformers, pipelines, uh, classifiers, Snapshot, any one of them, there are, there are more coming all the time. So all of them are relying on the same uh, backbone in the hugging face and we are connecting to this backbone. And we have a full integration with all the uh, um, tools that hugging face is integrated with, Jupyter Notebooks, Langchain, Amazon SageMaker, and more. Um, okay, so what do you get from us? Basically, let's, let's uh, count it again. What you get from our platform, uh, basically we have a smart model registry uh, with integrated security. So the first part is hosting the model. Uh, we provide a model versioning, model sharing. If you need few te few teams to use the models, if you have models that are private and you don't want them to be accessible to everybody, uh, you can do all of this through our, through our platform. And uh, you have release bundling. Okay, you can bundle together the model, the data. And uh, sorry, the model, the packages, the Docker, the configuration, OCI, etc., and the traceability. You can know where your model is being used, which is quite important. Then uh, on the caching part, we have all the caching of the remote repo, and this makes sure that your model will never disappear. And in the security part, we have both curation um, and scanning. Curation is basically a way to allow you to decide which models are getting into the organization and security or scanning is allowing you to make sure that no models that are not allowed are being in use, which is two points in time. And uh, vulnerability scanning, model licensing, we talked about it, curation is coming soon. Um, and of course you can connect all your, uh, your tools, all the tools that you need for governance and control of the ML development life cycle. Like if you're using Hugging Face, uh, ML Flow, um, SageMaker, Jupyter, Langchain, or Quack, on which we will hear uh, in a few minutes. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone. And uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or find us on the internet.
That was awesome. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thanks, Sohar. Um, I think very educational. We're kind of getting to the the root of how you actually do all of this AIML stuff and build things. Um, now for the, the next section, what we're going to do is we're going to have a panel. Um, Melissa McKay, who um, is a developer advocate at JFrog, is going to be moderating the panel. Um, we have a featured speaker, Ran Romano from Quack. He's the co-founder and CEO of Quack. So he's going to be joining us along with the rest of our panelists from the earlier earlier presentations. So take it away, Melissa. Hey, everybody. Hey, I'm really excited to talk to you all. Those are some fantastic presentations. I'm both excited and terrified, to be honest. <laughs> So this is um, my favorite part of the program here is just to have a little roundtable discussion on the content that we have just talked about and um, some other questions that it popped into my mind and may have popped into yours as well as we were listening to folks. Um, first of all, let's just go around with a round of introductions for everyone. And mainly, I think for our audience, I mean, I, when I see panels like this, I just want to see, I want to hear what your background is. I want to know a little bit about you, um, what your daily responsibles, the responsibilities are for your position. So I'm going to start with you, Bill. Uh, you did our first presentation. Um, Bill Manning, a colleague of mine at JFrog. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what your daily responsibilities are. Yeah, so um, you know, I've been with JFrog now for almost seven years. Uh, wow, it was when I say that it sounds weird saying it out loud. Um, before this, actually, my company before I joined JFrog, um, we actually back in 2014, 15, 16, uh, were doing um, AI and ML. We had chatbots. I had a company called Nuji, and everybody thought it was too creepy at the time. It was a kind of we were kind of ahead of the curve um, on what you could do. So, like I said, I had a lot of introduction to this before, and it was kind of fun, like you know, getting back on the bicycle after. For many years um, to kind of get back into this. But my daily responsibility is I work with our customer base um, and educate them on how to use the products, best practices. Uh, I work with our sales team. I'm doing this and other public speaking engagements, uh, but that's who I am. And it's, uh, I'm honored to be here, especially with somebody like Ram and uh, Zohar. Awesome. All right, next I'm gonna take this over to Zohar. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and what you do for JFrog. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, you're mute. There you go. So you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I can just do bad lip. I can do. I can just do bad lip reading if you want. I can just make up stuff. <laughs> um, real pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Zohar. I, I'm director of product at JFrog. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, MLOps Federation and the packages in JFrog, uh, which I guess everybody who uses JFrog at least. Uh, uses the packages, uh, so it's quite interesting. Um, and uh, I come with a very uh, long um, uh, technical background. Uh, before coming to JFrog, I was a VP R&D at a small startup, quite a medium startup, actually. And it was in the FinOps area. Before it, uh, I was a co-founder and CTO of my own startup in, uh, in the cloud as well. So basically, I'm doing cloud before it was called cloud and doing ML before it was called ML. And I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Sohar. Good to have you. And last but not least, we have our featured speaker today, Ron Romano, uh, from coming to us from Quack. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you've come from, um, your expertise in this area. Uh, we It's a pleasure to have you on this panel today, and I'm curious what you have to share with us. Um, tell us about your daily responsibilities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so great being here. Um, I'm Ron um, from Quark. Quark is, is an ML engineering platform. I assume we'll, we'll talk a bit about that uh, la later on. Um, I'm the, the co-founder and chief product officer um, at, at Quark, uh, managing the product and engineering organization. Um, coming from a software engineering background, in my previous job, I was at uh, Wix.com, uh, the website building company. I started at the data domain and then got kind of really um, attracted to the ML uh, to the ML domain. And I actually started and founded the team that built Wix's internal machine learning infrastructure. We built an internal feature store and did a lot of MLOps before it was called MLOps, as Zohar, Zohar just described. Um, so I built a lot of the machine learning infrastructure at, uh, at Wix before uh, founding, uh, founding Quark around uh, three, four years, three and a half years ago. I don't know, time, time moves weird in startups. <laughs> 
that is true. <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad to have you here. Lots of expertise on this piano, on this panel, lots of uh, uh, history and, and time in the industry. Um, myself, I'm Melissa McKay. I'm a developer advocate with JFrog. I've been in this position for about four years now. And, um, but Previous to that, I was a software engineer. So a lot of this material, I do not have experience with in my background. Um, so it's it's up and coming and new for me and I'm pretty excited to learn more and more every day. So uh, these presentations especially um, are the highlight of my day. Um, obviously AI and ML are not new. I think a lot of you have alluded to that, that uh, you know, if you've worked with these things in the past, but obviously these technologies are getting a lot of scrutiny today. So I'm just curious, um, personally, how has the explosion of this attention affected your day today? And I'm going to start with you, Bill. Well, you know, it, it's really, it's really funny. It is like for me personally, like you said, you know, this isn't a, a new thing. Um, I and mean, if we're going to go back, we go back to the initial inceptions. Like the first introduction I ever had to this was back in 1998, 99. Uh, we had, we had a CRM company. Uh, we were the first web-based CRM. And one of the things is we acquired a company that was called RightPoint. And RightPoint was the idea of like, pull your customer get data together. By the way, the guys who founded RightPoint were also the same guys who founded Marketo later on. Um, and the thing is, is, is that taking that information, turning into objective models that could be utilized for targeting and, and things like that really kind of was like the precursor to like what we see today in terms of modeling and then to watch the evolution of it. And like I said, before I joined JFrog, I had a lot of this uh, behind me. Like we were building models to build campaigns uh, for media companies in terms of like, uh, you know, based on personal uh, information as correlated to others in the same space. Um, now, uh, the explosion, now it's starting to, you know, it's got that bubble effect where now it's gotten ridiculous. Like I said, in that one slide uh, to see now that it's like AI chairs, uh, you know, like, what does that mean? And, you know, machine learning and, and objective learning and things like that. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm excited to see where it's going. I, I love this stuff. Like I eat it up. I, I, I love seeing the good. But then also, too, I'm also fascinated, like a car wreck when I see, you know, a car wreck when you're on the highway of seeing the bad. Um, right. So for me personally, I, I like I like the fact we're in this phase of, of more adoption because of more adoption will, will bring better innovation. But we also have to be cautious, just like every other previous, you know, you know, cycle of, of technology trends. You know, this is now the uh, investment side you know vcs are now looking at these investments as being uh they were very limited before but now they're bigger nice so i'm well, excited yeah yeah i can i you you show it for sure <laughs> <laughs> it is exciting to be uh in this involved in this today and we saw just during your present presentation today how this affected you um day to day you had a bunch of ai art in your slides, <laughs> that it was it and wasn't as it wasn't thing. as terrible. It wasn't as terrible as I was hoping when I was doing the output. Like I didn't get okay. anybody with like seven. I didn't get anybody with seven fingers or things like that. You know, yeah. Like hands 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 are the worst thing that AI art can do. They can't do hands <laughs> right. All right, um, I'm going to pose the same question to you, Ron. Um, how has this attention on all of this technology affected your day to day? Yeah. Um, so I think the the key the key phrase here, as, as Bill mentioned, is is adoption. Um, at least from from my pers perspective, uh, as, as again Bill said that uh, said before, ML is not really new. Uh, when I was in college, I don't know, years ago, uh, we also did that. We also did kind of a cool science projects in, in machine learning. Uh, what really blew up in the last uh, last few years, especially since kind of the chat GPT revolution, is the adoption of machine learning use cases for um, enterprises, for digital natives, uh, businesses, for basically almost uh, almost everyone. So this is what, uh, um, from at least my perspective, um, we really, at, at Quark, we're really uh, um, touching, uh, touching that point. Suddenly we have a lot more customers that don't only want to uh, implement new, cool Gen AI, uh, Gen AI use cases, but kind of remember that, okay, we also have another uh, set of use cases like fraud detection, like uh, um, classification that are, don't really matter for, like you don't solve them with Gen AI, uh, uh, tools, but you solve them, we solve them with classic ML use cases. But again, they're kind of swept away in a good way with the hype. 
Um, so we're seeing a lot more uh, general uh, general adoption. Certainly, it's not uh, uh, software engineers or data scientists that need to kind of convince uh, the higher management that okay, there's a new tool, cool thing called machine learning, called data science, and and let me show you what I can do with that. It really comes from from upstairs. Uh, uh, now, like we, we heard that a few times uh, a few times over the last month, like CEOs and C level executives are telling their companies, listen, there's a cool new thing called generative AI, called machine learning, called AI, called whatever. Do something with it. Okay, do hackathons. Do find find me a use case to, so I can kind of employ this uh, this technology. Uh, so this is something very new and and cool that we're that we're seeing. Interesting. You know, and, and you know what's funny is is that I I skipped a slide on I wasn't sure how applicable it was going to be and it's funny that you brought that up and I'll just share my screen just for one minute because like the idea was like I was like you know these are things that really, people are using it for right threat detection and classification mm -hmm. right network risk scoring application and attack security right you know securing mm -hmm. mobile endpoints you know entity behaviors that's the one that actually yeah. and I, I was going to ask you about that one entity behaviors is one of the most fascinating things I think that AI could really, you know, well, not AI, but and machine learning could really help companies. But oh, let's over yeah, talk about yeah. myself. Because because for I, me, I think that's the I think that's one area where I don't think it gets as much attention as it should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, there's some um, very, very legitimate yeah. use cases that we don't talk about enough. Um, I think I get swept away and and something by what Ron said too, is it just seems like there's a lot of novel use cases out there right now to get people excited, to get people on board, especially if you're talking about teaching people um, this technology. It's it's fun to build, you know, chatbots and things like that. Maybe not for an immediate, um, you know, actual production use case, but just to get yourself involved and get yourself learning all of this material. Um, Zoar, same question to you. How has these how have these technologies affected your day to day? Yeah, well, first of all, naturally, I created a new uh, product line in JFrog, so this is quite a thing. I thought that Ron would say <laughs> establish a startup in the field, so it's quite a fact. But uh, um, about two years ago, Benedict Evans uh, tweeted in uh, social network. It was called at the time Twitter, now it's called X. <laughs> uh, something like. Uh, in about two years, AI will be so commoditized that nobody will mention it in uh, VC uh, slides, in, visit, in the funding decks, because it will be the same as, <laughs> the same as uh, um, mentioning your database. It will be commoditized so much that everybody will have it. So he's, he was right on the second part. Everybody has it today, uh, but everybody's bragging about it. Let's give it another half a year, and people will, will stop bragging about it probably in a million <laughs> Continue it for sure. This is an, an, an um, a revolution like uh, I never experienced. I've been in the market for twenty seven years. Uh, I, I, I'm, I've been here since it was called working with computers. Uh, <laughs> I understand. I haven't seen anything like it in the past. It's truly unbelievable. It's in the size of the revolution of having a PC or having a cloud, uh, and. Uh, it's really interesting to see the use cases because um, we, we are working with uh, really large companies understanding what's the use case. And you can see companies who are uh, doing stuff that is undoable. It was undoable just, I don't know, a year ago. ChatGPT is about a year old. LLM is about a year old. It's unbelievable. And it's being adopted by companies with their adoption cycle is usually a year and a half. And they already have a solution yeah. with them. So it's yes. truly, truly unbelievable, truly fascinating. And it's not, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if Brian or Bill said, it's not uh, some CEO calling somebody and telling him, sprinkle some AI into the product we need the deck. It's like a company that's causing trillions or in hundreds of billions and having a tool that will make their flow, their business flow faster for their customers and more efficient for their customers. So for me, it's a really fascinating uh, time uh, to live in and on one end on the other hand i'm really happy that uh, the lifespan in uh, in our time is about only 100 years because i don't want to know what's coming next so, <laughs> like so it's funny yeah. so it's funny is is that when you're talking about the vc thing right so i used to be a vc 
right? So I used to be a VC with Vodafone Ventures. I was a senior partner. So like I've had three exits uh, in my early career. Um, and then I got, a, you know, and Vodafone approached me and said, hey, we would love for you to come in and, and you know, meet with companies. And even back in 2011, 2012, when I was doing that, um, I, I didn't like being a VC, I'll just tell you, but I'm still part of that community. And just recently, I, I met with a couple of friends of mine who were, who were doing that. And they said that it's so sickening that they've had to build filters throughout all their, you know, submittal deck stuff and all the way that people get, you know, submit, you know, for meetings, because everything starts off with AI power, right? And it's become almost like, this is how they think they're going to get the money. And it's not, like you said, and this comes back to some of the Rand set, right? With the whole thing is, it's, it's not just the implementation of an AI. You need to show the generalized purpose of why you would even do that. You don't have to say it anymore. And just like you said, Zohar, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to say it anymore. But Companies are trying to get that attention by throwing it into their deck to say, oh, we're doing X, Y, Z. It's AI powered, right? You know, it's like, it's almost like back when it was like, you know, like I had a company called For Home and we were IoT before IoT, right? We sold it to Google uh, back in 2010. And then, you know, IoT became after that. And it was like, but back then when I was a VC, every company was IoT because suddenly because it was like, everybody was like, oh, we actually have devices that do this. And I'm like, okay, that's not important. It's not your main business model. Um, what's your business model? What are you trying? What problem are you trying to solve? You know, just because you have it there doesn't tell me anything. I'm not just going to give you money because you said you had AI in your name. <laughs> you know, it's 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 gotten it's that next bubblish sound, right? Like, and then also too, precautionary tales. Like you said, this technology is relatively fresh. It's been along for a long time, but the way it's being objectified now is fresh and new and dangerous. Actually, yes. it's more dangerous than any other technologies I've seen in the past. Don't get me wrong. IoT was dangerous in the healthcare space because devices can kill you, um, right? I mean, literally kill you. Um, but AI can be more detrimental in some cases operationally, uh, you know, also to reputation, things like that. I mean, it's amazing what can happen now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, the hype is unreal right now. Um, I think I, I heard a panel just recently the other day how they're almost starting to get tired of, of talking about AI because it's always, um, you know, everyone's talking about it. Everyone has an opinion about it. Everyone's wondering where we're going with this. But it has actually uh, affected our day-to-day. -day. Mine as a software engineer, for example, I mean, there's um, chatbots everywhere on websites. So I imagine, you know, software engineers are working to make make those uh, more efficient and more accurate Um and I, I mean, just recently I pulled up my banking app and now I can talk to it, right? I can ask it, you know, how much money did I spend at the grocery store last month? You know, things like this that are, are novel um, ideas that- What I love that you just said is I was talking to it, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. That's, that, in my opinion, is where we've now hit the precipice, where people now have that almost borderline non-Turing test assumption of what's going on, right? behind yeah. the scenes and it's it's amazing i was talking i was talking with my banking app you're like <laughs> you know it's like yeah. there's yep. it feels exactly. real yeah it feels really real yeah um llms are just one example right i mean those are the most right. interesting for me to talk about just because sometimes they can get pretty crazy uh depending on you know what kind of data it's been trained on and things like that um Something I wanted to ask you, Ron, you have expertise in this area. Can you talk to us a little bit about retrieval augmented generation and what are some of the yeah. use cases around that? First of all, define what that is to our audience in case mm. they don't know. Yeah, um, so retrieval augmented generation in kind of um, I don't know, one, or, one or two sentences is, um, I like to kind of describe it really simply as adding context uh, to uh, a query or to kind of a, a question, a question to a generative model, uh, to generative model. Basically, uh, um, you're generating uh, you're generating responses and you're augmenting these responses with uh, uh, data that you you retrieved from uh, from somewhere, and that somewhere is usually these days uh, vector databases. Uh, this is kind of the technology. So usually, when people talk about uh, talk about RAG, they're talking about a combination of an LLM, um, whether it's OpenAI, Anthropic, or any other, I don't know, Llama two open source uh, open source application, um, an embedding model, 
what we call like you can internally at Quark a, a vectorizer. Uh, so things like either two or, or any other um, embedding sentence transformer, for example, is, is very popular. And a vector, a vector database. Uh, for us at Quark, we have a vector database. And Pinecone is another uh, well-known example. Yeah. So RAG is usually an application that consists of these three uh, these three uh, uh, components. And the main use case uh, uh, for RAG, that we're actually seeing two main use cases for uh, uh, for RAG um, for RAG application. One is um, a little less uh, less known. I think it's recommendation uh, recommendation engines, recommendation systems. Uh, this is what we're seeing. But the, the most popular use case that we're seeing today for RAG, it's chatbots. Really, chatbots are kind of the classic example for uh, for RAG uh, RAG application. We're seeing a ton of them um, on top of uh, um, on top of Quark. And, and what's unique about having a RAG uh, RAG application is that allows you to add your own context. Uh, for example, we have one, one company uh, that is the, for, uh, managing a set of, uh, of hotels and, hosp and, and, and hospitalities, uh, for, for example. And, and what they're doing is they actually have a chatbot for, the, for their customers. And because their chatbot, I think they're using some kind of, whether it's an open source or open AI, it's not trained on their model. So how will their model know regarding their data, their private uh, private data? So this is where they kind of store it in a vector a vector database and take it away from the vector database, inject it in the prompt. Uh, this is what's called prompt engineering in that uh, in that sense. So prompt engineering in this case is from the user query and the context uh, uh, retrieved from uh, from the vector store. This is how they ask. So, hey, uh, ni dear, nice say uh, open AI. Can you please ask, can you please answer the user question about where is uh, property X is located given the, okay, this is the context. This is the, uh, uh, the data that I retrieved from the vector store that contains, for example, all of the locations that the user that my customer has listed. So this is that usually how these, uh, these work. Yeah, no, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, yeah. When I'm first learning about LLMs and stuff, you know, the simplest thing would be to think that, well, the internet is your resource and now you can ask it any question you want. And um, obviously there's lots of contradictions in there. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of uh, interesting answers to your questions uh, that might not even be correct or true. So it makes sense to add context, um, even in the even in like uh, with engineering, for example, I've been playing with plugins in my IDEs, right? So it's helpful that my IDE um, knows what files I have that I already have open that I'm working in um, before I start asking questions on, you know, building boilerplate for some portions or how to write a particular mm -hmm. method or, or recall, you know, something like that. Now, so, yeah, really, I have a question for Rand actually. So, in this case, you know, like when the customer, so the customer provides their own vector database, is that what you're, what they do in this case? Now, in this case, do you guys mm -hmm. have like uh, any sort of sanitizing tooling or you know things that you provide to help them, or is it all up to the customer? Because, like I said, one of the things that, like you mentioned the inject, you know, the prompts, right? And I was like, I love that whole idea, but also prompt injection attacks is is another thing, right? That happens with you know these kind of models that are more public uh that are out there do you guys now do you guys have any like you know do you supply any warnings or any guidelines uh to the customer before they supply the vector database to you guys to utilize for this shape so not yet um, okay um, actually um yeah so llms is, is moving so fast that uh, yeah. you know security for llms application is something that uh, that is even uh, even younger so if llms is one year so security for llms is, is even younger than that um, i i think that in in most cases what we're actually seeing in companies right now is that they're a bit uh more a lot of the companies are a bit even before kind of the stage of completely uh, understanding how they're handling things like prompt uh, prompt ejection, they're more like understanding if their packages, things that you're doing in uh, uh, in hugging face, understanding if their general architecture has some vulnerabilities in them, and 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 kind of more playing around in order to gain confidence in the in the LLM. Like for example, I saw a tweet a few days ago that uh, that had uh, um, that kind of proved again. I don't know how much you can prove things on OpenAI that if you ask, if you write please before an OpenAI uh, query, that it writes better, better, uh, better answers. Like uh, who can, who can know that? 
Yeah, that's, ama- I, that's I amazing, to... though. That, that's amazing. It's like it's like a, it, I it, actually it, didn't it's try it out. It's actually implying feelings, almost, right? It's implying it's, an it, emotional. It can be, right? But but who knows? Like, who knows how do these things work? Who knows? Like, if I write context dot dot, then if I write the context in another way, if I write please, so it's all it's all kind of playing around. So I think our, our customers are trying to kind of understand. Um, understand what's the best ways to utilize these uh, these generative uh, models because they're kind of they're beasts to, to tame okay for a logistic oh, model yeah. Uh, yeah. for a regression model so you know what the factors you know how okay you made a decision you you can know why why it made a decision okay for um for a neural networks it was even harder but there mm-hmm. were tools to understand it but for llms a closed source llms impossible to know that uh, so gaining that trust in understanding how exactly the model will answer to you, even given a context, is is, is something that we see our users, uh, I don't know if struggling is the word, but playing around oh. a lot with and trying to build confidence. Well, I, just, about... I have my kids, you know, when I, I, I huh? teach my kids, uh, they are like young adults, I teach them how to draw with the co-pilot. And I told mm-hmm. them, draw me something, something, something. And both of them look at me and say, you didn't say please. <laughs> there you go you gotta it's have important. your manners you need to be polite yes. yeah oh yeah I, well, yeah I bet even with that like you mentioned the large language models my big thing is is that i think a lot of companies struggle and i've talked to some people about this too is it's like when you look at the number of parameters right when you when you pick a model an llm and the number of parameters you know, they can be from anywhere from millions to, to billions of parameters right and how do you how do you segment those parameters properly to train your model when you have you know millions or billions of, of parameters and right. that those parameters if not properly chosen or you know using them when you're building it um could skew your model tremendously right oh. i mean like i said you know and that's the yeah. thing so it's like having you know that's the thing is i think a lot of companies jump into this without understanding sometimes that's the reason why like my whole talk was like about efficacy and and things like that because I think that's problematic in a lot of the industry is it's like, just because you can doesn't mean you should, uh, right? Without right. without having, you know, you can't just grab a model and run with it. You should always have some sort of domain expertise behind it to ensure that those yeah. things are what they are, right? So, Bill, listening to you ha- with that explanation, it made me think of, uh, you're basically describing how to raise children. <laughs> right. No, you are, right? And, it, it, and, it, left, yeah. Every model is a child. I mean, when you yeah. create an yeah. algorithm to decipher that model, you know, like that information, you are, you're, you're teaching a child. And, you know, and the more information, you parameters you give it, you know, the expansive, more expansive the knowledge. But the problem is too, and there's something important, Rand, that you said, and this is some word that you're, everybody's constantly using this, it's context, right? It's yeah. like, without the knowledge of the context, it can be misinterpreted, like, please, right? It could be sarcastically, please, you know, or it could be like, hey, could you please do this for me, right? How do you interpret it without inflection or tone or some sort of emphasis on the context or before and after it? Right. I'd, I want to talk about that a little more um, under, let's go with this question, and I'm going to pose this to Zohar first. What do you think the main differences are between traditional software engineering and ML engineering, like what we're talking about. I think it, what we just talked about is the main thing. You know, with uh, with software, you have a very clear consistency. You know, you you taking a language that is somehow comprehensible to us. You are running it through a process that is very complex but very structured. Everybody, not everybody, but it's really easy to understand what a compiler does. And then you have, yeah. uh, and then you have. Um, a piece of zeros and one the computer understand in only one way. There is no other way to understand it. If I will ask a software what's uh, five uh, plus uh, seven, I will get 12 anytime for sure because that's what the thing knows to do. It's like, I, I usually say it's like a toaster. You put two slices of bread and the cheese, and you get a toast. That's all. That's all it does. It, does. it knows how to do. Repeatable, uh, yeah. 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 And if you build it today and in a week and in five weeks and in a year and in 10 years, if you maintain the operating system, the packages, everything, which of course JPO can assist you with, um, you will get the same software. It depends on the file. Sometimes the field of the date will be changed. It depends on which language you are, you are compiling. But you will get the same identical software. 
And if you will take if you take a model or an algorithm and train it on the same data using the same parameter seven times, you'll get seven different binaries in a very high probability. And if you take a model and then we'll ask him how much is a uh, five plus uh, yeah, what was there? Five plus seven. Yeah. Uh, it can answer many, many things. It depends on the context that it understands from it. It depends on what it was trained. It can draw you five point seven. That's a joke eight. I really like on that. Exactly on, really? uh, on that. Yeah. Okay. Now oh, we have would, the dad. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, so I hear the joke. Someone, someone, yeah, now I do. Someone too. goes into, someone goes into a job interview or a data science position. Um, and and uh, the guy asked for software engineering position doesn't really matter. And the guy in the interview asked him, "What's your specialty? What's your specialty?" Like, I'm really good at machine learning. I say, okay, how much is uh, five plus six? And he answers seven. Like, no more nine. No more eleven. You're right. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's quite correct. You know, it's like uh, people are are using. Uh, Chat GPT. There is a, a radio show here in Israel that once in a while they're writing their names to Chat GPT, asking who is in the name of the of the anchor of the show, and every time Chat GPT answers something with with clear clear confidence that is completely wrong. Oh okay. yeah, it has nothing. <laughs> to do with the person. Right? Yeah. They have a gender neutral name, so it can it can confuse the gender. It can confuse the job. You can go, it knows something about art, something about being part of the movie industry. So it makes makes name of movies, make name of name of song. And by the way, ChatGPT, when you're asking it to write your code, can make names of packages. <laughs> and these packages immediately, when hackers found out about it, they created those packages because it's a very interesting collateral. And do you uh. know who can be blocking it? It's here. It's, here, it's written here. JP. Yeah, there you go. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So this is quite amazing. You go to something you believe in, it's supposed to give you good answers, and you tell him, tell him, I want to multiply two numbers in Python. And you get a software that takes X and Y and import, I'm a malicious package that doesn't exist, and um, math. Okay? And all yeah. of a sudden, you have I'm, I'm a package name, I'm a malicious package that didn't exist before inside your code, inside your banking code or your accounting code or your business code or whatever. So that's quite amazing, quite frightening, to be honest. Um, so that's that's one part that is very, very different, okay? The second part is this This is an infinite, infinite loop, okay? If my software hit the production servers and it failed, it has a name. It's called a bug. And I will take the software back and I will fix it. Okay. It might be a scale bug. I need to make my, my software more scalable, more fast, or have better performance to, to meet the scale that I need. But with machine learning, it might happen that we created an AI that understands you for your bank account on January, and it never met a shopping spree until October. So it understands <laughs> everything you tell to him until October. And then in October, the entire data is being changed because you don't want to know how much you spend in the grocery store. You're starting to asking how much money you have for present, which is a totally different question. And it will be oblivious about it. And you need to retrain it. You need to redeploy it because the software is basically sort of useless for the new use cases being created, okay? Seasonality is very important in this, in this case. Um, uh, change of the world, of the world, okay? If uh, if uh, you have a software that identifies shoes, this is a funny story. I have a, somebody in the office was talking about the shoes she bought a few years ago. She didn't remember the maker, the brand. She wanted to buy them again. I took a picture to uh, to Copilot and told him, please identify the brand and we found the store. Okay, so this is something unbelievable. But if we trained the software to work, if we assume that our customer base is, is I don't know, uh, people who wear women's shoes ages 10 to uh, 15, and all of a sudden they mature and they start to to take photos of like more nicer shoes or more I know, Oxford shoes or whatever, our software will be useless for them. So because the world changed, not our software. Our software was solving or supposed to solve one problem. And this is this is another part which is very interesting. 
And the third part is about monitoring. When I monitor a software, I have a monitor, when monitoring software. It can be Core Logics, it can be Datadog, Mixpanel, whatever. There are many, many brands in the in the market. Grafana. I don't want to to uh, forget somebody, but there are about four hundred of them in the world. Mm -hmm. And and I'm telling my software that it should report me about something. But when I'm working with a model, once in a while, I want to throw a data I didn't make sure that it's still identified data it's supposed to identify. And once in a while, I want to dump the entire memory of the process in order to check it in my lab, in my lab and see that it's still thinking the, thinking the way I was thinking. And as Rand said, it's become harder and harder with the size of the models. And this dump can be like one gigabyte log, okay? And and it's it won't fit in your log system. It will tell nothing to your log system. You need somebody to analyze it at the lab, and you need a system to store it in and to connect the model version. And again, there is a company with a solution for this. Okay, so what company? Animagic. <laughs> Nothing with with an animal. I'm not sure if it was a duck or a frog. <laughs> They're aquatic uh, and friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so it's it's a lot of changes it's a lot of uncertainty uh, and this is the same change excellent thorough answer if i could sum up it is wildly different software engineering is wildly different than ml engineering um and to me it's it's a little bit uncomfortable because like you said there's a little bit of comfort for software engineers that you can just uh, you know repeat um, something and get an expected results over and over. And um, I know one of the reasons I, there there's a culture way back when, uh, you know, someone that might be comfortable in going into software engineering might be less comfortable with people. But I think as all of us mature in that career, we understand that the biggest problem we face every day as software engineers, it's a people problem. It, it's figuring out, you know, how to best put our skills to use. And um and the biggest question that we have normally is, uh, like Zohar said, is it a bug or is it a feature, right? Like <laughs> these are things that, that we worry about. When it comes to ML engineering, so different, a lot more to consider. Basically we're building something that is unpredictable. And um, there's some use cases that maybe that isn't the best thing for. Um, one other area I wanted to discuss before we close out our panel, um, and so hard touched on it is security. Um, there's there's some interesting factors that we need to consider with security when we're uh, in these technologies. And I just want to pose to each of you from your perspective, uh, what is the most challenging part of implementing a security strategy? And is it getting the new tool sets established in your processes or is it the development of that process? And is this to a people problem? I'm going to start with you, Bill. So it's funny as is, is, you know, we got, so it's not that, you know, he's over here. Oh, this side, sorry, Zohar, right? So like my job is to work with the customer base, right? Our, the, the customers that come to us with these exact problems, right? And the thing is, is that having the ability for us now to talk to the customers and say, here's how you can go ahead and store your models. So you're not always pulling down 10, 20, 30 gigabyte models, right? To do your training, be able to munge it, upload it into ours, security scan it, is part of the thing that we're doing. And part of that is also education. So for me, it's a very different perspective, right? My perspective is I've got to talk to the customer, find out what they have, what they're trying to do, how they want to, you know, what they're trying to solve, and then do my best to interpret it and then say, here's how you should do it. And here's what we offer in terms of making sure that we can't address all the security things, right? There's a lot of it, like I talked about before, you know, education, you know, making sure the data sets are correct, you know, making sure they're not biased. And, you know, those kind of things are more manual, but when it comes to the side that we can help, Right, we can at least alleviate part of that for the customer. Give them a, a sense that that you know we can help at least in the side of things that are more uh, tangibly based. Right, you know that it could be malicious or or something. And so for me, it's a different answer because like my job is to really help interpret the customer's needs and requirements and provide the best solution. And for us. I think because of like, you know, the like, you know, as you know, Zohar was saying, you know, like when we start talking about the company that's up here, um, you know, us, uh, you know, we have a solid offering, you know, we have the capabilities to really enhance overall security. And now with the MLS side, um, 
it's really just bringing attention to it i think more than anything because once again because it is more greenfield it is still new there's still a lot of questions you know like what is security um right you know, like we talk about security what is security in ml and and there's various degrees of that and we you know we handle this one section that's very essential but there's still other parts of it that are more non-tangible security like i said like you know biases and things like that so for me my answer is a little bit more a little different so for me, it's like, how can we help within the parameters that we have that are not part of the larger, more ethical approach, like I said, governance and things like that? Makes sense. Ron, I'm going to pose the same question to you. Most challenging part yeah. of implementing a security strategy. So I think the, the current problem for what we're seeing from our customers um, is, is, is a problem of, of you know, I, I try to think about it in your in your terminology, is it a people problem? Is it a process problem? I think it's um it's a mindset problem um, right now. So it's it's hard enough. It was hard enough to kind of um, have developers think about security in their in their day to day. So adding that kind of implementing that mindset to data scientists and to machine learning engineers to people that are doing research that are analyzing data and now they need about securing their machine learning models it's something that is you know 180 degrees away from uh, from them uh, so they're not really aware of, of traditional um, security issues things like bias and, and things like that that okay I think they're, they're a bit more aware um, of these things but downloading a model from uh, from hugging face okay then i'll just download the model from hugging face what can what can possibly go wrong if i'll download <laughs> a model from hugging face uh, what can possibly go wrong if i'll download some package that has cool code that i need uh, that cuts strings in half from uh, from pipi uh, so <laughs> they're, they're not really they're not really aware um, of these uh, of these things so in this case i think it, it kind of lends itself to more of a uh, of um of a tooling, uh, tooling problem um, afterwards. Like how, okay, uh, a data scientist will not think about security security all day. Let, let's let's take that as an, uh, as an assumption. Uh, it's not going to happen. I, I won't go to, to it's, I'm not going to make it, uh, to make it uh, happen. Um, so how do I create the tools, the processes uh, that help them do that? And I think in the software engineering domain, we did that uh, well. You have X-Ray and other companies have, uh, have other tools. So this is why I'm, I'm, I really like uh, the hugging face uh, vulnerability scanning uh, um, offering that you just uh, that you just released because uh, uh, packages we know how to handle, but models that are okay, really kind of a, a different uh, different beast. Um, so wow, yeah, they can have security problems. Who 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 would have thought about this uh, this uh, this thing? And I don't expect data scientists. I don't expect ML engineers to think about it for every model that they use and for every new revision of the model that they use. It's it's it doesn't really make uh, make sense. We need to create tools and processes and add. And, and kind of install them in their mindset that, okay, security posture is important also for machine learning and machine learning models. And we need to make that experience as smooth as possible. Awesome. Makes sense. Excellent. Zohar, from your perspective, what do you think the most challenging part of implementing a security strategy is? Yeah, so on, on top of what uh, Ryan and Bill said, which is um, I totally agree with all of them, um, there is a there is a very interesting uh, challenge in uh, in uh, closing the floodgates, okay? Because machine learning introduces. Uh, we talked about few vectors earlier, few attack vectors earlier with, with bogus fake packages and malicious models and everything. And there are more vectors which are not always something you can detect, uh, but uh, can have huge effect on your. Company like I'm not sure if you heard about it. The New York, New York Times is uh, pressing a lawsuit on uh, OpenAI on uh, on um, IP infringement uh, because they said something that like they wrote the title of a New York Times article and they got the article, which proves that somebody has scraped their site and just emitted it on request, which is an infringement of the IP. So you we are being exposed to more vectors of a tech uh, that can affect our business continuity. And one of the most important thing in this area is being having the ability to react to it, to be um, to be proactive or maybe to be reactive in the most proactive way 
possible when something does happen, when we do find there is a problem. So on one hand, X-ray by itself is providing a very good solution to it, because if I'm using a, a model and it, at some point in the future, somebody is, is exposing a vulnerability in it, then I can roll back the model easily, which is rolling back sounds like something really fun. You do it on, the, like you sit on the grass and you roll back and everything, but in software, rolling back is one of the most painful things you can do. It's breaking the entire software. You need to have the entire package of things that work together and put them one version backward. This is something we do very good. This is, this is something that now, uh, thanks to our support to hiring face and to models, can be done in the model arena as well. So when you need to be active really, really fast, you can do it. That's 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 something that is really, really hard. And uh, and um, same go for versioning because collaboration uh, can be a, can be a, a problem as well. Um, and understanding which version running where is a very very interesting security. Basically, they're not considered security, but they are very interesting security problems. Uh, if uh, if I found out that one of my models, one of the, my LLM model is emitting a New York Times article, there is a huge difference if this model is being ran by my accounting team to find stuff about our balance sheets easily, or is it being exposed to customers throughout the connection to intercom uh, customer facing uh, uh, chatbot, okay? This is a totally different game, totally different game. If my accounting team can emit New York Times uh, articles from a, from a model, I can change it sometime. Everything is okay. I can block it. Everything is okay. But if one of my customer will emit from my support chatbot a New York Times article, my lawyers will hear about it so fast that the speed of light will seem slow for a second. So uh, that's the main that's the main uh, challenge there because security become larger. It's not just uh, it's not just regular regular compliance that we know how to handle it's more um more complex story we have a long way to go we do mm -hmm. a lot of these issues that we need to consider and be very careful with as we move forward with our applications and how we choose to you know integrate ai and ml into our lives um i just want to go through just get some closing spots from the three of you um Make it personal. So what, what are you looking forward to the most with this technology? Something that is that affects you personally. Mine, um, you know, super helpful for me to be able to know how much I spent on groceries last month. <laughs> I like applications like that. Um, let's start with you, Bill. So I'm all excited for the delivery of my Rabbit R1 um, that's on its way right now, which is the uh, handheld uh, AI interface device. <laughs> I don't know why I'm an idiot, and I and I, <laughs> I really want it. Um, I want to see what it does, and for two hundred bucks, you kind of can't beat it. Um, but what, what uh, is it? What's the name? Rabbit R One. Go look it up. It's super. It's yeah, well. really. It's it's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Another, another super surveillance device you're going to buy for two hundred dollars. Hey, you know what? I, I love when people. I like I buying. Love, uh, I, I, I love when people say that and they're like super stuff. surveillance device. I'm like, you have that on you all the time anyway. So what's one more, right? It's right. like, <laughs> but, but it's, um, it's super fascinating, right? So there, there's, you know, now we're getting into the phase of, you know, like I said, everybody integrating things into it, always talking about AI, blah, 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 blah. The R1, and like in this case, I want to play with this because you ever see the movie Her? You know, so there's the movie yes. Her, you know, like, right with Joaquin Phoenix. It reminds me of that kind of thing. And it's like the fact that we're getting there where it's got a camera, you know, like doing no AI recognition and things like that. This is something actually I was trying to implement back in my company that had before JFrog, which was pulling out the information and being able to do like purchase buys on videos that people are watching, um, you know, just by figuring out what they have for the content at the time. Um, but I'm excited like where it's going. Cause I think, I think it's going to become more ubiquitous. I think it's going to, I think computers are going to become more, you know, conversational even more so. And like the R1 in my opinion is kind of the first step. Um, yeah. We have Siri and stuff, but don't, I don't consider that in the same vein because this is, it's not very conversational. This is where I'm excited, um, where I, I think it's gonna become more ubiquitous to do things, uh, like I said, when you're talking, just talking, you know? It's, I, 
it's hard to explain if tangibly put into words, but I think, you know, like I said, cars and are now getting there too, right? I think you're gonna be able to have conversations with your car, you know, like you can already say, hey, route me to the nearest, you know, charger and do all these things. But there's, I think it's gonna be more be like, hey, while you're there, why don't you go take a look at this, you know, like suggestions. And I don't know, I think it's gonna become Interesting. Help, more helpful than hurtful in the long run. Cool. Zohar, how about you? Uh, well, I'm the slowest, uh, fast adapter, early adapter in the world. So uh, <laughs> I'm like, uh, I just, I just installed my IoT uh, water heater about two weeks ago. Oh, nice! <laughs> Seven years after. That's awesome. uh, for me, the most fascinating uh, thing is the ability to uh, to consume a lot of data and really savvy, savvy of uh, of learning. And the ability to summarize uh, um, long, long, long articles that uh, that somebody uh, put tons of effort to decorate them with splendid English and vast uh, um, usage of adjectives and just get, you know, he said now from the AI, for me, this is the most fascinating thing, um, which I'm using quite a lot. That's the one thing. And the second thing is the ability to create a presentation with very stupid imagery, like muted. <laughs> yeah. I share this uh, see with him. Um, awesome. <laughs> All right, Ron, we'll leave off with you. What um, What are you yeah. looking forward to or what What do you use now um, in your life? <laughs> yeah, so I'm actually quite addicted to to kind of the Gen AI use cases. I'm not writing, uh, not writing a line of code without uh, a co-pilot helping me. I'm not basically not writing an email without uh, ChatGPT um, also helping me. So it's kind of degenerative in in, in a way. Um, yep. I don't know how to write emails anymore. And I, need, <laughs> so I, need, uh, I need help. So I, I, I want to kind of reduce my, uh, my, the, my usage and my usage pattern. But uh, uh, basically... Um, I'm thinking about how I can make it kind of a full-blown personal assistant. Um, as, as the theory is, is kind of that, but I really like the concept of agents. We haven't really touched that, but I really like it. Agents that can actually do things. They can you know, look online, that can create code, that can, uh, I don't know, structure data, that can order, order groceries. Um, so all the concept of agents in the combination of, of context that has kind of my knowledge base, um, entirely and having the actions of knowing uh, um, what do I want to do alongside um, a simple generative AI kind of conversational uh, aspect. I think it, it's, I think it'll be, it'll be amazing that everyone will kind of uh, have a walking, talking, I don't know for walking, but a talking personal assistant with all its relevant context and, uh, and agents be able to do anything that he wants to, he wants to do. I think it's, it's kind of an amazing, uh, an amazing future. Go look at the video for the R1. That's why it got me fascinated. That's the whole. I will. Thing. I will. That's the right? first thing it's I'm so going to do afterwards. Right. It was so like I saw the, the saw the demonstration of it, and I became like you said. That's a, you're you're hitting on exactly why I got excited because like to me, like you said, point solutions are fine, but I want a full blown. I mean, I, I remember a company I worked with years ago um, when I was doing like I still do mentorship and stuff, and one of them was when I was doing my other my AI, AI stuff. They were trying to build a personal mm -hmm. assistant, but the context wasn't behind it, right? So it was like it didn't. The tools weren't there. The the information, the language models, nothing was there. Now it's like yeah. now it's right, and now it's like like I said, I want to be able to be like talk with something and be able to say you know schedule the cell, call so and so, send the message. And when yeah, like I said, I was like, that's where that's where it needs to be. <laughs> Computer, open the Fantastic door. Fantastic conversation, awesome. Um, I'm going to go and wrap up the panel. Pleasure to have all of you on here. You have all a plethora of, of ideas and stories and um, all of your experience together has been incredible to listen to. I really appreciate your time and uh, for having this, this uh, informal discussion with me. I uh, hope, hope the audience enjoys it. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out. Of course, we always have folks that are interested in what you want to know and um, looking to provide you the answers that you need. Um, I have one more thing I want to announce before I send it back to um, Steve to wrap up the call. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, we are going to have a webinar 
um, myself and Sunil Bimarkar, who's a senior partner solutions architect at AWS. Uh, we're going to be doing a live webinar tomorrow to learn about JFrog's newly announced integration with Amazon SageMaker. And uh, we'll talk through some of the use cases there, provide a demo of that integration, and we'll also answer your questions live. Um, if you're an AWS AWS customer, obviously you might be interested in this, um, but even if you can't make it because the time doesn't work for you, go ahead and register because we'll send you a recording after the event so you can watch it on your own time. Look forward to seeing you there. All right, thank you everyone. I'm gonna pass it back to Steve. Cool, um, thanks a lot, Melissa. That was an awesome panel. Um, I think we've we've seen that not only is the, the AI going to create images of what the future is gonna look like, but they're now gonna um, control the future with agents and um, devices and things which are our extension. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be a personal assistant right now. That doesn't seem like there's a lot of job security. Um, although never never count out executives who always need help on things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, I want to thank all of our wonderful presenters and panelists today. Um, so amazing presentation. Bill, um, I think Zohar and Sean did a great job of bringing it home and tying it in with actual um, development capabilities. Um, it was an amazing panel. I want to give a special big thanks to Ran Romano for being our, our featured guest and bringing a lot of insights um, from all his work in the AML space. And um, hopefully our, our audience enjoyed this, got a, a lot of valuable content out of this. And um, look forward to an email after this um, after this hangout with the winners of the gift cards. So, thanks everybody for joining us, and um, come join us for both the webinar Melissa mentioned and also the Nev next DevSecOps hangout. So, thank you all. Thanks everybody. Be safe. Thank Be you. Well, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Rand. Thanks, Laura.